being the last plenary speaker gives me the privilege to share a few thoughts on the quality of this uh, second UNESCO Merck Africa Research Summit. I really have been impressed by the quality of presentations and discourse from academicians, clinical researchers, professors, um, policy makers, and even ministers of health. But even more importantly, and this is my message to all of you younger participants, I've been genuinely impressed by the quality of the science that I've seen in the posters. We will go to the poster sessions in a minute. But even if you're not amongst the prize winners and laureates of this meeting, you should really feel proud of the science that you've produced. We have the capabilities. This is high quality research. Um, I'm exposed to research um, every day in my role as a professor at the University of Freiburg and a research um, member committee at Merck. And this is high quality science that all of you should be proud of. So go out there, continue your great work, publish and be seen, not just in Africa, but, um, but beyond Africa. Very briefly, um, this is my agenda. It will focus around the theme of access that we've spoken a lot about um, at this meeting. But the central theme is really that bioethics in Africa are connected to access and are meaningless without access. Um, I'll give you an example on what this means for Merck. This is about action. And we believe that doing research here gives access to innovation. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the scorecard that Merck has gotten from independent organizations on providing access to medicine. Um, and then I will briefly focus on our bioadvisory panel, which is a panel of external experts that guides us on how to do ethical research. Um, finally, I will close with the pediatric Prezi-Quantel program that Merck conducts. Now, before coming here, I asked our R&D organization to do a snapshot of the clinical trial um, footprint, essentially, that we have at this very moment in Africa. And you can see a quick summary here. Um, we have currently 17 active trials that enroll patients, a total of 49 um, sponsored studies, some starting up, some closing, but 17 are enrolling patients. Um, we have um, eight in North Africa, seven in South Africa, only two in this region, Sub-Saharan Africa, so we can still do better. But very importantly, um, if you look on the right-hand side, um, of course we're most active in the later stages of development, which are first in a capability-building um, value chain. But we do a lot of innovative research here in Africa. So seven studies each focus around oncology and immuno-oncology and immunology, which is the core of our innovative research pipeline. Let me spend um, a minute or two on the Access to Medicine Index, which um, has been talked about briefly. This is an independent NGO uh, organization called Access to Medicine Foundation that has a very numerical quantitative scorecard on how pharma companies do in helping to provide access. And what we are genuinely proud of here at Merck is that we've moved to the fourth position globally in this index, and we have been improving for the last five consecutive years. If you look on the right-hand side at what criteria actually define this actually to medicine index, you can see that many of the things that we talked about at this meeting are central to the ranking, such as research and development, um, R&D, um, manufacturing, but also capability building. A couple of best practices were mentioned, such as supporting vaccine manufacturers, approach to building capacity in manufacturing, the clarity in approach to intellectual property, some of which we um, farm out, um, and finally, to build capacity in recognizing falsified medicines, which we know is a huge problem in Africa, and there is a small solution called Merck Mini Labs, which is a portable suitcase 
at uh, very low cost, most of which are donated, that are independent from power sources that allow you to detect amongst 170 or more um, falsified medicines or verify um, the correctness of these medicines. So um, in building R&D capacity, we truly focus on, on public health needs. Now, briefly, as a company that focuses on R&D research, on clinical trials, but also in the life sciences, we have business problems every day that focus around business ethics and bioethics. And we have a panel of international advisors um, that provide guidance to us. And we are very meticulous about um, discussing this guidance, debating it, and then fully implementing it into our policies and into our governance framework. And it then becomes the rule for how we operate. And um, our chairman, uh, Professor Frank Stangberg Hafferkamp, at the very beginning was kind enough to mention that um, we are actually looking for an African bioethicist, an expert in bioethics, to join this panel um, as early as next year. And um, I've already received one or two business cards with potential thoughts. Um, if you have a candidate that's a genuine expert in bioethics, I would be more than happy to speak to you after the meeting and please, please come and see me. Now, a few thoughts on our host country that I investigated prior to coming here. Now, this is really an outside perspective, um, but it's perhaps an interesting, an interesting documentation of how far the practice of medicine and bioethics has come in this country because this is from a brand new textbook uh, of, of bioethics um, and I will not review, it would be remiss to do this in the host country, I'm honored to be here, but I think it's important to recognize um, this story of success of bioethics here in our host country of Ethiopia. Um, fundamentally, Going back to the access theme, bioethics developed with the availability of modern so-called westernized medicine, but it's critical to understand that it can never work outside of any cultural framework. So transplanting western bioethics to Africa is doomed to fail, and we've seen examples of that failure. So very briefly, these are some of the milestones achieved here. Um, at uh, Addis Abeba, one of the first faculties to have IRB's ethics committees to actually teach bioethics, and the first ethics committee to receive a WHO um, recognition. There are private research institutes. Um, there are, of course, the Ministry of Science and Technology. And I have to tell you that um, I was impressed to see His Excellency, um, the Minister of Health of Ethiopia, as a practicing academic physician now leading governance of healthcare in this country. That's certainly something um, we could use in a couple of countries in Europe, including Germany. But I did not speak to him because I would be guilty of committing to the brain drain. Um, so clearly, this is an outside view of what we would consider a success story if we can succeed in supporting access and making sure that the important bioethical problems, and we've talked about them in the past days, actually make it into successful implementation. Very briefly on how we deal with bioethics at Merck. Um, it's a global standing expert panel um, that generates its questions from the business at Merck every day. One of the latest themes is genome editing, which for us is a completely new frontier. We've recently acquired Sigma Aldrich, one of the largest life sciences companies, and um, we are now one of the leading manufacturers of genome editing technology, tools, and devices, and it opens up an entire new spectrum of bioethical considerations that pose major challenges for us. And uh, 
it couldn't be more interesting and, and timely. Now, very briefly, this is the panel as it stands today. Um, we have representatives from law, from legal, from philosophy, from theology, religion, um, from the practice of bioethics themselves. Um, we have contacted um, Professor Gorisha Abdul Karim from South Africa and are still hopeful that she might have the time to join us, but quite frankly, she's very busy doing other things. So we need a genuinely and fully committed member of this panel. And again, please come and see me after, after this presentation. Um, a choice of topics, let me just revert to um, the clinical trial discussion on research in resource poor countries. One of the key themes whenever we do clinical trials is that number one, the population into which we go has a realistic opportunity to have access to those medicines after the study ends. So doing a high class oncology monoclonal antibody study in the most remote areas of Africa comes with its challenges and we will only do this if we provide the study medication to patients after closure of the trial, which is something that we always do, without exception. Um, let me um, then perhaps go to the example in the red box, which is our pediatric prasequantel development program, where I will spend a few minutes uh, on what was done in this program. Essentially, you've heard a lot about schistosomiasis, uh, Jutta Rainer Drupp, who leads our translational innovation platform, Global Health, is in the audience. Um, obviously, pediatric populations are almost always vulnerable. Um, this is an age group between a few months and six years. And in the low resource setting here in sub-Saharan countries, the ethical challenge becomes even greater. It's important to protect the rights of families and children, but also respond to the urgent health needs. And um, we are part of a consortium formed in 2012, a public-private partnership. In fact, we lead that consortium to eradicate the disease um, in the long term. So we at Merck uh, have developed Praziquantel. We produce it and we donate it. Um, we have a firm commitment backed by the Merck family to eradicate the disease. And um, I just learned from Utah that we are now capable of supplying about 200 tablets a year, which is enough therapy to treat 50 million adults every year and um, a roughly equal number of children. Then we have support uh, from Brazil um, and, uh, and other technology partners. Some of the bioethical considerations uh, you will see here on, on this board. Um, it's clear that blood sampling is a critical theme in any pediatric style, not, not just in Africa, but elsewhere. Informed consent is critical. You need literacy and you need language in the clinical trial personnel that people can understand and connect with and relate to. Um, there are always patient follow-up issues um, and that relate to quality and they are critical for clinical trials that need regulatory approval. And of course, poor governance and in some cases, corruption and, um, and hostile conflict. Um, needless to say that um, the program was exposed to ethics committees, that's common practice. What's important is that these were submitted to ethics committees that are experienced with pediatric trials and ethics committees that are experienced with pediatric trials in the African setting, which in this case was the African Research Ethics Committee and additional um, review boards uh, in, in Tanzania. And, and basically, this is how we approached our external experts for guidance in this trial. We submitted the program to them and very simply said, from a bioethical point of view, do you agree with our approach? Or are there other things we should be thinking about, considering and rolling out? And in this particular case, we found the guidance to be particularly valuable um, because, of course, the foundation of this program 
is highly ethical. But we all know that sometimes poor quality comes out of good intent. So good intent clearly is not enough. Um, they advised us to publicize the social value of the program, to actually go out and communicate, um, to engage in educational programs with local stakeholders, including, as we heard earlier, um, tribal heads and, and senior members of the cultures and perhaps clans, and very importantly, um, post-trial access, which is part of our statutes at Merck, that we will not um, deviate from. Finally, there was a, um, a recommendation to create an elementary school and secondary school curriculum to educate families on, on the disease. And um, again, you see um, how we solved um, the blood sampling challenge here. It took a lot of active effort, visits, explanations by the clinical trial staff, and a lot of appropriate conversations to be able to do this in the right way to ensure parents that blood is used for scientific purposes, not for ritual or religious purposes, and that this is all being done in, in the proper way. And finally, it sometimes takes business practice education and rigor to help patients understand that we cannot compensate patients in a clinical trial. It's against GCH and ICP. It would be unethical because providing a high reimbursement in a low re in, in those countries would be an unethical incentive to participate in a trial. So the educational effort, therefore, is to educate on why we can only compensate for travel, food, or other incidentals. So let me close by, um, by this example where really we believe the ethical guidance has been successfully followed. Um, there was a clear recommendation to partner with the WHO or other um, external outside of Merck partners as a best practice, both in terms of execution but also in terms of bioethics. And that's something um, that um, Merck has done. We now donate uh, Praziquantel to the WHO. And the WHO is in charge of distribution in affected countries. So um, with that particular example, there are many others I would like to close. Thank you all for attendance uh, at this amazing summit, your active participation. Thank you so much. Thank you.